So ghosting a canyon, first off, is certainly not uh, a beginner level skill set, I would say. It's a little bit more advanced. Um, but it's that I leave no trace idea that we won't leave anything behind in the canyon besides our footprints in the sand. And that includes all anchor material. So there are some special tools and tricks that we can use um, so that once we've done the repel, we can retrieve everything from the bottom. All right. Well, thank you, Melissa and Herb, for being on the show today from Desert Highlights in Moab, one of our favorite places. And I'm not making this up. It is like a mecca for us. And somehow every single year we end up turning our RV, ending up in Moab for an extended period of time, whether it's a month or two months. And we're so grateful to uh, have you as partners because we were able to experience Moab in a completely different light than what we typically do. In the past, it's been all about exploring the national parks or mountain biking our legs off until we can't anymore and taking a day off and mountain biking some more. But with canyoneering, you guys have completely changed the way we think about revisiting Moab and exploring some of the, the hidden gems. So thank you for being on today and doing what you do at Desert Highlights. Yeah, thanks for having us. Absolutely. <laughs> so talk to us about uh, how you guys got started and how the company got started and how long have you been with Desert Highlights and when did you take it over? Uh, take us back to what canyoneering looked like in Moab, um, whether it was before Desert Highlights or where you guys, if uh, you guys kind of started that in the area. Oh, sure. Well, canyoneering has been around for a long time and, you know, maybe we didn't always call it that, that, that term probably came about in the nineties. Um, but some of the roots, especially on the Colorado plateau date back to exploring around in Zion. A lot of the original canyons in Zion were first descended by rock climbers, just simply trying to get off the top of formations. And then some of these climbers kind of went in and solely started looking in, at the canyons after that were just surprised by the amount of adventure you could find in that. Uh, so in the Moab area specifically, you know, we're not really known for our canyons like the way we are for some other things, national parks, Jeep trails and all that. And so it's been more of a recent surge in popularity. So Desert Highlights was started back in 1997 by this guy, Matt Moore, came out to Utah from Ohio fell in love, went to school at the University of Utah and moved down to Moab pretty much right after that. So the first year Desert Highlights was in existence as actually a, like a booking agency, thus the name. So you would call Matt, he would tell you, here's the best river trip to do, here's the best national parks hike to do, yada, yada. Did that for about a year and honestly just kind of got bored with it and realized that there wasn't at that time anybody offering guided canyoning or rock climbing. So he kind of shifted his focus to a guide industry. So in 1998, got permits with uh, Moab BLM and the Park Service here and a few other agencies and started guiding. Um, we consider Matt to certainly be one of the pioneers of the canyoneering uh, around the Moab area. You know, to guide something commercially, it's quite a process in terms of getting permission from the landowners, getting permits, insurance, and all that. And so a lot of the routes around Moab that are today considered trade routes are Matt's original uh, guided trips. Some of those we managed to keep a secret for a long time, you know, with the internet and beta being the way it is, you know, word got out. And we still have some trips that we don't, you know, advertise so that we can have that special experience of having it all to yourself. But the majority of our routes are, are, are out there and, um, and for good reason. They're a lot of fun. You know, a chunk of rope is an amazing tool to just start to explore some of these slots and canyons around Moab, for sure. That's amazing. Uh, um, Go ahead. And it was all around Matt just getting out there and exploring things on, uh, on his own kind of curiosity and then turning those into commercial routes, then going to the BLM and saying, hey, I want to try to run this as a tour, which nobody was doing before, it seems like. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So Desert Highlights was the first commercial canyoning outfitter in town. Um, and in a lot of ways, Matt paved the way for other companies that would come later. 
Yeah, um, I can imagine all the work that went into building something from scratch. Uh, absolutely. You know, these federal and state uh, agencies to try to run these and then figuring out insurance. I can, I can imagine there was a lot of work done by him to make, to pave the way for others. Absolutely. And there was probably some, what we might call pirate guiding going on at that time where they sure. were doing it under the wire. And I think Matt really brought it to the forefront and brought a certain level of professionalism to the industry. Sure. So I started working for Matt in 2007 and uh, Melissa started in what, 2014. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we had a chance to buy Matt out basically in 2015. So we've had the company since then and he stays on as a consultant, but he's actually become a pilot. So he's flying all over the place these days. He's checking <laughs> on you guys from the top. Bro, right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And it was kind of cool when he was getting his pilot's license, you know, we, well, Herb especially um, and friends were uh, able to help Matt build ours uh, by uh, flying around in a plane with him over uh, some canyons and stuff and looking at potential new routes and stuff like that. So it was kind of neat when he was getting into flying that, um, you know, he could use that to, uh, to find new places to go. And Herb and I still, um, you know, we've been putting some new routes together um, since we took over in 2015. Um, so we're still certainly trying to do that. Um, Keep the legacy going. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, a lot yeah. of the thrust of that originally with Matt is just this sense of adventure, the, the sense of exploring um, and bringing a leave no trace approach to the canyons so that the folks that come behind us get to have that same experience. And you know, yeah, that, I really course, like that. Um, I learned a lot through from Melissa about this, about is it ghosting a canyon? Uh, oh, sure. About what that entails in, uh, you know, we're all seeking that first experience, but what is that about canyoneering and how can somebody ruin it? And what is that process? Sure. So ghosting a canyon, first off, is certainly not uh, a beginner level skill set, I would say. It's a little bit more advanced. Um, but it's that uh, leave no trace idea that we won't leave anything behind in the canyon besides our footprints in the sand. And that includes all anchor material. So there are some special tools and tricks that we can use um, so that once we've done the repel, we can retrieve everything from the bottom. And again, I got to give a tip of the hat to Matt. He developed what, to my knowledge, is the first retrievable anchor system that was out there on the market. Well, it wasn't ever commercially produced, but um, essentially when he started guiding in Arches National Park, specifically in the fiery furnace, a lot of hikers were, well, not some hikers were coming across as anchors. And so as a way to address that, Matt came up with a system that allowed us to do the repels and take the webbing with. His original design is called the Slick. It borrows off of the three pin system that skydivers use to cut away from a primary chute if they'd use their backup. Right. Nowadays, there are much simpler devices out there. Uh, the smooth operator or um, the fiddle stick. There's canyoning companies like Imlay that are manufacturing these. Uh, and it's essentially, it could be as simple as passing your rope around your tree, putting a special knot in it where the uh, toggle, a lot of people call them toggles, it goes through the knot. After we do the rappel, we can remove that toggle and everything falls away. Uh, oh, and there's a lot cool. of other things. Yeah, absolutely. And so the next person or group that shows up, they don't see any anchors and they get to have the experience of figuring out how to safely get down on their own. Oh, that's cool. So uh, uh, thank you for sharing that. It gives me a better understanding. It's uh, essentially a anchorless experience. Yeah, no absolutely. And there's a okay. lot of ways we can achieve that. You know, what we described is just one or two options. There's tons of techniques out there. Yeah, I really like what you said about uh, not leaving any footprints except only in the sand. And I think in Moab, that's really crucial to understand because there's the cryptobionic soil. Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit more about uh, just the crypto soil in general in the deserts? Because I think a lot of people, including me for a long time, did not fully appreciate uh, the uniqueness of this, uh, this oh, life form. Yeah. So uh, yeah, can you tell absolutely. us a little bit more about it? And if you're seeing any challenges across Moab, um, we'd love to get the word out about how to prevent 
uh, the destruction of the soil? Oh, it's constantly a challenge. You know, I think land managers here are always faced with that challenge of educating visitors about our fragile living soil crust. You know, we had no idea about it when we moved here. But basically, when you're tra traveling around in the backcountry of Moab, we assume anywhere there's loose sandy soils that there's this fragile soil crust uh, growing or attempting to grow. Cyanobacteria is the main component and it stabilizes the soil. Over time, other things like uh, blue-green algae, mosses, fungus, lichen, all kind of grow together, creating what scientists are calling a biological soil crust. So it's really fragile, and without it, nothing would grow here in the desert. So that soil crust stabilizes those sand dunes so that they don't blow away during strong winds. Um, it also works like a sponge and retains moisture after rain so that moisture is available to plants longer. And we also like to say it's a nitrogen fixer, which means it's actively producing food for plants. Unfortunately, it's incredibly fragile. Just stepping on it tends to pulverize it. Um, crust are typically not visible for the first 10, even 15 years. Well-developed crust that you see out there an inch or two tall could be 100 plus years old easily. And eventually wow. it'll create a nursery environment for other things to grow. But plant life really struggles in its absence. That's really, uh, thanks for going into the details of all the things that get impacted by it. I always assumed that it was just a crust and it's so unique and it takes so many years to develop that we should try to preserve it. But the moisture retention and its impact to other species and uh, brushes and other things to be able to survive is critical. And Absolutely. I can see how without that, you know, it gets pretty windy in springtime and, you know, you're going you're to have massive dust storms and all that sand is just going to it's going to blow away right and absolutely uh, it's not a quick fix and it takes decades to get it back to where it was with the restoration yeah and a quick a quick example of that you know the rumor is that the san juan mountains over in colorado are feeling the effects of that when we get our strong spring wind um sand is actually kicked up in the air and carried by the wind and being deposited on the snowpack which we've heard is causing that snowpack to in addition to look, just look dirty to melt out a little faster so there's all kinds of other consequences that are unforeseen. Yeah, I read about that in uh, Outside Magazine as well. They're seeing these challenges in Colorado from uh, ATVs and off-road vehicles kicking up a lot of dust, agricultural dust, and how the, this dust from you know hundreds of miles away even is impacting the snowpack and in a larger way, the climate uh, changes and issues that we're seeing. So something as small as not busting the crust people can help save the LaSalle Mountains. So yeah. thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, you guys are just like the adventure heroes of Moab for me. Like there's so many different trips that you guys do. You have pack rafting, rafting, climbing, canyoneering. Uh, what are the different things that you guys offer just so uh, for someone coming to Moab or someone that's already been there, they want to either escape the crowds or get away and try something different if they've already been to Moab and they've already been to Arches National Park and Canyonlands. Uh, can you talk to us about a few of the trips that you offer? And they are so unique that I'd like to go into a little bit more detail of each of them after. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so canyoneering is kind of our main um, thing. Um, and uh, we offer a bunch of different uh, canyoneering routes, half day, full day, summer. Um, easier than others, um, but most of them can be um, done by beginners. I mean, you don't have to have any kind of experience rappelling uh, or climbing or anything like that. And most of the people that we take out um, don't have any experience at all, uh, which is uh, part of what we really love about offering this service to people. Um, and it's a great way to get off the beaten path because um, you have to have a rope and a harness and the skills um, to to get to these places. So that what that's what makes them so special, um, you know, and different from just your standard hike. Um, so yeah, canyoneering is a big part of what we do. Um, in what 2012, Matt incorporated pack rafting. 2008. Uh, wow. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, he was certainly an early adopter of the pack rafting. Yeah, and for those that don't know anything about pack rafts, um, 
They are one person uh, inflatable boats. Uh, they roll up to about the size of a tent uh, and they weigh about five pounds. So super wow. light, uh, super packable, uh, very durable for, um, for what they are. Uh, and so we've got those um, four piece uh, kayak paddles and lightweight PFDs. And so with a, you know, six, seven pound package, um, you can open up a lot of opportunities with these uh, pack rafts. So uh, we've got some canyons that we guide where you can't exit that canyon without using a boat. So you go down the canyon, you get to the river, and you either have your pack raft with you and you blow it up, um, and, you know, paddle to an exit or whatever, uh, or you, I don't swim in the river, organize a war rig to come pick you up at a certain time. I don't know. So those pack rafts are, you know, they make some of these canyons, um, uh, available to us, which is pretty cool. Um, that is amazing. You know, I've met somebody yeah. 50 years ago. It's like, man, I wish I had this pack raft. Cause they probably got to the end of that canyon. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, now I'm stuck here. <laughs> it has revolutionized exploring in Canyon Country yeah. for sure. Yeah, and just like being able to get back to wherever you started or the different ways you can shuttle and incorporate the pack raft is so, so cool. I, I can't wait yeah. to come back and take that trip. So is there a certain time of year where the river flow and out of the Colorado can go up and down where you guys are offering the pack rafting trip versus, or if it's just better yeah. to take during one time or the other? We kind of offer pack rafting spring through the fall. Um, that being said, spring runoff levels around here are usually peaking mid-June. Uh, okay. So late April through late July is kind of when the rivers are up typically. But that's you know one of the beauties of pack rafting is those boats only have a couple inches of draft in the water. So they can access terrain that a large raft or even canoes couldn't by being able to travel down these small watersheds. You know, some of these, especially some of these ephemeral creeks that are maybe they're dry 90% of the year and then you get a flash flood, a foot of water is flowing, that might be enough to, to get out in the pack raft. You know, a trip like shoots of Muddy Creek down in the San Rafael Swell is a premier technical canyon float out trip that you just can't do most of the year, you'd have to hike it. But in the spring, if we get enough snow, you know, that becomes something you can boat out. And so catching it at that perfect level when it's only available for two or three weeks a year is also a big part of the, the draw. Super cool. Of course, the Colorado, the Colorado and the Green Rivers, they have enough water year round to, and that's where we're mostly taking our guided uh, pack rafting trips around the Colorado and okay. the Green. That's right. Um, and then do you have the, the pedal Paddle. Yeah. Pedal. Right. That's right. <laughs> pedal, paddle, pedal. Yeah. 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 So we that. Yeah. So we strap the um boats to the bikes. Um and have, you know, the paddles in a backpack or strapped on or whatever. There are a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, and our PFDs and lunch and water, everything for the day. And we ride down an old mining road. Um down to the river, uh, to the Green River. And uh, once we get down there, we blow up our boats, um, strap our boats on the front of our mm -hmm. boats and float about 10 or 12 miles downstream to uh, a takeout. And there are a couple of options there. You can either float all the way to the boat takeout or you can get out about three miles upstream of the standard takeout where canoes and rafts and stuff would would take out with a boat ramp and everything. Um, we like to take out uh, in a canyon upstream of that, roll our boats back up, put our bikes back together and ride to that takeout. And that section of river that you visit on that trip, um, a lot of people are doing uh, three, four, five day trips to float through that section you know, which we love doing overnight river trips, um, but most people don't have that time. Um, and so right. that paddle, paddle, paddle is a great way to see a really beautiful section of river um, and use pack rafts in one of many ways that they're meant to, use, to be used. 
um, and yeah, have a cool multi-sport adventure. Um, it's a big day. <laughs> so um, a lot of riding, a lot of paddling. Um, that's certainly a trip that if the river level is up, um, then that's kind of prime time for that because you can just kind of sit in your boat and float. Um, but if yeah. The, yeah, if the river's lower, you're doing a lot more paddling. But either way, it's a really cool trip. That is so amazing. It's yeah. so unique. It's where else can you do this right like there's that's such a cool adventure i can't wait to come out and try it myself yeah, Where, uh, yeah. for the pack rafts is this something someone could do diy i see that you guys rent them as well uh so you could like provide an itinerary and put ins and say you could go do this yourself or is it guided only uh, oh we do it all yeah you can do standalone pack rafting trips there's a nice section of class two that we guide uh oh. or you could rent boats from us and go out on your own um we will occasionally arrange shuttles and and give people advice based on river levels and, and all that so yeah any number of options there a lot of folks are definitely planning trips down into canyon lands that they want to rent boats for you know linking up the maze district with the needles you know maybe even island in the sky becomes easily doable in a few days with a pack raft so we see a lot of rentals going into canyon lands as well okay Cool. So this is for typically some of your advanced folks that are coming to Moab and a little bit more adventurous. Doesn't have to be, but yeah, usually, you know, usually. it's folks that are have done backpacking, have done mountain biking, whatever it is. And they just feel like the idea right. of getting a boat. Yeah, exactly. Sure. And the cool All thing fun. too about these boats is that, you know, you have a family, whether they're doing a guided trip or renting a boat on their own, and they say, we don't want any rapids, you know, we just want a flat water section or we want like two rapids and then flat water, whatever. And with an oar rig, with canoes, even often with kayaks, you have to have a boat ramp, right? To back your trailer up to. And with those pack rafts, there are so many different, it just opens up so many options, even just on the roadside section of yeah. the Colorado River through Moab that you just don't get with a boat that you have to have a boat ramp. For. So we, we can accommodate different abilities, different goals, different um, at different times of the year with different river levels and stuff like that to kind of fit what people want on guided trips or make suggestions for rentals. Well, that's amazing. Yeah, that's and I didn't think about it that way. And you know, your put-in options can become so much more open, like you were saying earlier. But absolutely, uh, what that does to the number of places you can go—that's so cool. How do they yeah. how do they steer in or uh, compare relative to like a raft or a inflatable kayak in flat water with limited flow? Sure, yeah. So we use a kayak paddle, of course. Um, they're comparable to an inflatable kayak or a hard shell kayak. They usually don't track quite as well if it's windy. Okay. You know, you're you end up doing a lot of these short strokes in the front of the boat to kind of maintain your your forward momentum. Um, okay. so they, you know, maybe don't track as well in waves. They're more forgiving where a, a plastic kayak has hard chimes or edges that are mm. more grabby. These big round tubes are more forgiving and allow you to kind of slip through these lateral waves and whatnot. Uh, okay. so it's a bit of a trade-off. If you were trying to put in big miles on a, a slow moving Creek, you're going to be working pretty hard in a pack raft. Okay. You know, the guy in the sea kayak would definitely be blasting by you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but of course, that's usually not why we're choosing a pack raft. Sure, it's a whole different, a whole different tool. Yeah, and yeah. we're using um, solely uh, alpaca raft brand pack rafts, um, and they're constantly, um, you know, upgrading and and making their boats better. And they have a bunch of different uh, models, so they've got you know some whitewater specific models that um, might track a little better or you know, do better in, in white water. And then they have some like super, super light boats that you're using for backpacking to just cross the river. So you barely even need the boat, but you definitely need it to cross the river. And so they have different models that you can use for different uh, different things. So yeah. and they're an awesome company. They're over in Mancos, uh, yeah. Colorado. Life so, is what you yeah. Mancos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. A, that's actually a super cool town. I really love that area, Cortez, Mancos. Uh, it's a great to... spot. Yeah, I'm definitely gotta give a shout out. Go ahead. Give a yeah. shout out to uh, Alpaca. You know, I think they 
kind of get the credit for starting this new sidebar industry. You know, the company was started by Sherry Tingey. She was making boats for her son, Thor, up in Alaska, doing these big overland trips. Uh, and to our knowledge, they are the only boats being made in the U.S. So they're handmade over there in Mancus. Um, so we like to support them being kind of the original and buy local and all that. Yeah, actually, I, I remember reading that story. It was really cool on their website. And I'll leave a link to them uh, in our show notes to make sure that they people can go check them out. Yeah, um, for sure. I'm nerding out on uh, pack rafts for a reason because, you know, yeah. we live in an RV. So anytime we can compact our gear, it's, it's a dream. So totally, awesome. yeah. Open water paddling. Uh, there is so much that you guys offer. So for someone coming to do a, you know, three-day weekend in um, in Moab, and they maybe just have one afternoon, what are some of the, like, close-by canyoneering trips? I know we did the medieval chamber, which was amazing. Uh, can you give us a, a little bit of an overview of, like, if you have, you know, half a day, you could do this. If you have a full day, here are your options. And multi-day adventures people can find on your on your website, but if you want to go into a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. So uh, for an afternoon, you know, four to six hours, uh, the medieval chamber that you guys did uh, is a great option. Three miles of hiking, two rappels, both around 100 feet, uh, pretty big, dramatic rappels. Um, so that canyon's uh, really great for people that are really excited about rappelling. Um, and the other half day that we offer right now is called Intraho Canyon. Um, and that one has a little more adventurous hiking, uh, some kind of off, off trail, uh, off, <laughs> I don't want to say off trail. You're, we're on a trail, we're on crypto yeah. hiking. <laughs> right, right. We travel on durable surfaces. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of scrambling, climbing around on rocks and stuff to get up to right. the top. Um, and then you visit a nice brief uh, slot canyon um some pools of water you have to wade through uh short 15 foot rappel um an 80 or so foot rappel at the end um so a lot of fun for kids kids really like that canyon um okay. because the hiking is a little more engaging because they get to climb around on rocks and stuff and um so that canyon is pretty playful um it's a lot of fun uh and then for a uh, full day you know six to eight hours or more uh, we have a bunch of options um and usually those canyons cover um a little more mileage uh, a little more elevation gain um they're not necessarily harder than the half day canyons but we're out for longer um usually they have more repels between three and six uh, repels depending on which canyon um, you choose. Um, so okay. those are nice if you know people are looking to spend a full day out um, and go even further off the beaten path. You know those full day routes. We've got a few that uh, nobody else has permits to guide. Uh, we can kind of right. guarantee solitude, which is pretty cool. Um, and yeah, and then we do offer uh, some multi day trips and. Those are uh, something that a lot of times when we're out on a half day or a full day trip, we we kind of get into talking about those multi day trips because people are asking, you know, this is cool. I want to, you know, do more of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How can I do more? And so they, um, you know, we will take people out uh, in even more remote areas, um, and we provide camping gear. Uh, we'll provide food and everything, so your guide can cook you a nice dinner after a day canyoneering um, and a breakfast the next morning and then we'll go out uh, and do another canyon so two days of canyoneering or three or you know we've had people come out for eight <laughs> days well that's, and that's not often, but... custom sounds like you yeah. guys kind of walk through what is somebody looking to do and it's totally. not absolutely you know uh what's available on your site when you add to cart and check out do you guys go through a lot of uh, understanding what the user is looking for and build, you can tweak things even though you have some like uh, general trips. Definitely. Oh, sure. I think that's a big part of what kind of makes us stand out, honestly. First, we're doing private groups, so it's only gonna be your group, your family. And, uh, you know, whoever is on the phone, a lot of times it's Melissa, you can tell that she cares about uh, the clients having a positive outcome. And so giving a lot of detail about other trips, 
getting a lot of info about what they want to get out of it, what their experience is, uh, especially those multi-day trips. We've got so much potential to really cater and, and make specific trips. I mean, there's thousands of canyons out there. <laughs> yeah. We're adding more canyons every year. So there's right. really no limit to that. Well, it sounds like you guys are set up for success with your private groups for the pandemic. I'm sure. Yeah, that was. I have to <laughs> <laughs> We didn't have to change as many things. That worked out pretty well. Yeah. And I think that's where we see the world going is, you know, uh, smaller, smaller groups, custom groups, and just your, just your pod, right? So yeah, I think even Absolutely. After, yeah, once you get used to that experience, it's hard to break that. Yeah. 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 And just to circle back to leave no trace a little bit. The land managers around here consider group size one of the biggest things we can do to, to lessen our impact. So oh, from, a commercial, from a commercial standpoint, if we're in a wilderness study area, we're limited to a group size of 15, which we actually feel like is, is too big. <laughs> this should be mm -hmm. lower. Um, but in terms of, of folks listening here that want to come out and visit, you know, keeping that in mind of small, traveling in small groups is probably one of the biggest single things you can do to really uh, improves that experience in nature too because you know the quieter it is the more you can take in the amazing landscapes when you're standing in the medieval chamber you're looking around like you need a you need a moment to take it in and Absolutely. That, at, least, yeah. at least that's how we felt and it could be easily missed if there's just a, a large group and there's a lot totally. going on right? like that yeah experience. a lot of noise yeah and that noise can carry and echo and yeah yeah. Well, hopefully um, that, you know, with this next, this last year behind you, you guys got some nice R&R because &R, I bet it was a crazy year and you're excited for yeah. the coming year coming up. So you're just getting started with the 2021 season. When will you officially be open and, you know, the podcast is going to live forever. What are you, what is your typical season for um, visiting Moab? I know you guys closed for a couple of months. Yeah, we kind of close in the winter and it seems like our shoulder seasons are shrinking as the city kind of promotes tourism more and more and tries to get off season travel. But for us, it's really President's Day weekend through Thanksgiving is, is when we offer trips. Um, obviously, some are seasonal, but uh, yeah, we're ready to go. We got our first trip of the season next week. Hmm. On Saturday, a couple days from yeah, now. Yeah, a couple days. <laughs> Well, enjoy that downtime. So what are some of the things that you guys are exploring around Moab, maybe getting outside of Moab that if somebody's taking a trip to Moab, they haven't considered some of the other towns and places. Uh, so if there was, you know, if somebody had a couple weeks, but they only want to spend maybe three days in Moab, what are some other towns, areas, road trips around that you recommend that you personally would look at? Uh, you know, more and more, we're starting to reach out and explore the Escalante area. It is sandwiched between some national parks. You know, it is partially a national monument, but I think it gets overlooked. Some of the wildest slot canyons on the Colorado Flat are out there. It's an excellent adventure, uh, whether it's mountain biking, like you said, bike touring, there's all kinds of stuff. So that area is certainly overlooked as people are dashing off from national park to park. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think Moab and Southern Utah in general is becoming more known for the amazing dinosaur trackway sites that we have yeah. and dinosaur bone that can be found on some hikes around okay. here. That seems to get overshadowed by some of the extreme sports and all that. But if you're into geology and some of that kind of history, uh, it's amazing and, and overlooked, I think. I totally agree with you. And we went and did a midnight hike on Halloween to go the, up to the Klondike Bluffs hike that has all these dinosaur tracks. There were over a thousand tracks. And yeah. <laughs> I, it wasn't one of the like more popular things to do. Yeah. I, literally one of our highlights after years of visiting yeah. to go see that. And it was so cool. The, these tracks were like massive and they're everywhere. So uh, yeah. I totally agree with you that there's so much of geology and uh, the nature side of the area that gets missed in the adventure mm -hmm. sports. Not that there's anything wrong with adventure sports, but. Oh, no, we love them, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all do, right? But on the rest days, maybe we, we could all take the time to appreciate the, the beauty of nature. Absolutely. Uh, well, I absolutely love what you guys are doing. Thank you for providing human-powered adventures. We need more people uh, out there, you know, using their bodies, getting out, appreciating nature and preserving it. I know there's a lot of 
extreme sports in terms of motorsports that are happening and ATVs and uh, there's a lot of environmental impact that goes there. We just want to be collectively providing experience and giving people options to get out using your own body, you know, enjoy nature, get off the beaten path, but responsibly do so. So thank you guys for making it your mission to and your life to take people outdoors responsibly. And uh, I want to ask how you two met, actually. I thought that was a pretty good story. So I, I think it'd be... Uh, oh, I mean, I'll, tell that. I'll tell it, yeah, sure. Yeah, I don't want to leave. <laughs> I tell it all the time. <laughs> I think I've got a dial. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, Herb was guiding uh, for Desert Highlights. This was what, 2012? 12 or something, I think 2012, right. maybe 11. Um, and hmm. I came out and did some canyons with some friends. My parents saw some of my pictures and said, we want to do that. And at that time, I did not know what I was doing. Um, and, <laughs> and so I said, if you want to do that, then hire a guide, uh, you know, and I'll, of course, tag along. And so they hired Desert Highlights um, to do the medieval chamber trip that you guys did uh, and an afternoon of pack rafting. Um, and Herb was our guide. So uh, my family, my mom, my dad, uh, I think my brother was there um, and my Aunt Kathy and my Uncle Pete, um, they were terrified and Herb did what he does best and <laughs> coaxed everybody over uh, the first rappel in the medieval chamber and did a great job. And supposedly on that trip, my mom and my aunt said, uh, I wish Melissa and Herb could date. <laughs> and we were dating other people at the time and we didn't think anything of each other, whatever. So um, I moved out in 2013 and went in to Desert Highlights um, to see if they were hiring um, in 2014. And Matt said, uh, sure, if you want to tag along on some trips and we'll teach you, you know, how we guide and the way that we do things. And if you catch on, you're hired. And, you know, if not, then, <laughs> then you're not. Um, so I followed her around in a bunch of canyons on a bunch of guided trips and stuff and learned a bunch of stuff from him. Um, and at that time, we were both uh, single. Um, and they, I guess I did a good job and, <laughs> and I was hired oh, and the rest <laughs> is history. <laughs> That's amazing. I just found that to be such a cool story. Yeah. And I'm sure, uh, the experience that you guys had, you know, repelling and learning, you're like trusting each other with your life out there and sure. training Definitely. through that process had a lot to do with building that early trust in the relationship. Yeah, and and you know I I always uh, looked up to her for guidance, um, including uh, advice on where I could go um, for a backpacking trip for an overnight. <laughs> um, so you know I approached her and said, "Where's where's a good place for me to go backpacking?" And he was like, "Oh, I know where we can go." <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so we can go together. <laughs> so we went on a backpacking trip uh together that herb invited himself on <laughs> which i thought was kind of funny um but uh, anyways <laughs> well go you guys adventuring together running a business together uh being a badass couple so keep that up and hopefully the dog the and uh, i forget the other dog's thing magpie is the one that looks like, looks like alpha yeah magpie uh -huh. and raven. raven raven's the other one yeah. Awesome. Well, give our love to the dogs. Uh, you can find Desert Highlights on yeah. tripoutside.com or check them out at Desert Highlights. Show them some love on social media. And I really encourage you guys to go take a trip, whether it's a uh, start off with a half day trip and then ease into the multi day trips or just jump right in. These guys are awesome. We personally vouched for it. We took a trip with Melissa, who is an absolute badass, but also just so relaxed and calm. I really can't say enough about how much we enjoyed our experience. Uh, so we can't wait to see you guys again. And I hope you have an amazing season ahead. Yeah, yeah. thanks so much. And thank you and Julie for uh, what you guys are doing too. We really appreciate you guys. Thank you guys. It was great to, great yeah. to connect. Awesome.